Hello everyone, welcome back to Mind What Matters, where we talk about all things caregiving and minding what matters. Today's interview is with the incredible Dr. Elizabeth Komen, my new girl crush. (laughs) (laughs) She's not kidding, everyone. We have gone full fangirling over this guest. Full fangirl. We are here to share that not only is she a brilliant oncologist, but she is a woman's woman, and Mm -hmm. she is here for you. She wants to dispel all of the myths about women's health, what we've been taught. Um, Her book, all in her head. All in her head is incredible. Which, first of all, perfect title. Whenever she, her book is about the history of women's health, I had many big feelings after this book. I was so grateful to her for writing it. It's the most comprehensive, detailed book that I've read about the history of women's health, but it's also palatable. It's emotional, it's tender, it's specific. And when you finish this book, you will feel like you just had an entire master class in the women's history of health. But also, I was left feeling, yes, grateful for her and for all the women who came before her that blazed trails in women's health, but also enraged, <laughs> sad, yeah. disheartened. However, she brings a lot of hope. She does. And solutions. I loved her vulnerability. She's just totally honest and raw about what women have been through, the total false bill of goods that we've been sold our whole lives, how easily we found ourselves um, gaslit time and time again. Told you're fine, just take a Xanax and go about your way. And kept small. At the, at the end yeah. of the day, women have been made to feel small their entire existence on this planet. And for the first time ever, we are kind of starting to blow the lid off that. And what more of an exciting time to live in. I'm so excited for you guys to hear this guest. Yes. Welcome back to the show. We're so excited to be your hosts and um, we can't wait. Everybody enjoy Dr. Elizabeth Komen. Dr. Elizabeth Komen is a medical oncologist specializing in breast cancer and an associate professor of medicine at NYC Langone. She earned her BA in the history of science from Harvard College and her MD from Harvard Medical School. Dr. Komen has dedicated her medical career to saving the lives of women. She's an award-winning, internationally sought-after clinician and physician scientist and the author of All in Her Head, which provides in such detail and thoughtfulness the history of women's health. And she lives in New York with her family. Welcome, Dr. Elizabeth Komen. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for being here. We're so happy to talk to you this morning. (laughs) My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Your book, All in Her Head, I would love to start there because it has, it is one of the most comprehensive books I've ever read about the history of women's health. Every person who goes to med school should read this book. It should be required reading. 100%. It should be required reading for every woman out there. It is a gift. Thank you for writing it. It explained so much about the mistreatment, treatment of women still today in our healthcare system. And just in a like geeky out way, I love how you used the 11 organ systems to tell the unique history of women's health. How did you even come up with that idea to do that? So in terms of how I thought about writing the book, I I definitely had imposter syndrome because I think I know a lot about medicine and taking care of women today, and I have a love of history, but I'm not a PhD in history of science, and I come from a very academic background, so I had to first kind of have this bravery and courage, could I do this in this expansive way? And then I thought about, well, how did I learn about the female body in medical school? And as you know, we learn about it in physiology. We learn about the organ systems, and for me, I really wanted to reframe what we perceive as women's bodies and walk Mm -hmm. through women's bodies as we've been taught them in medical school or not taught about them in medical school. And that really mirrored the physiology courses and the organ systems that we learned about, but in so many ways excluded the history of women and women's health presently. Oh, I thought it was absolutely brilliant that you did that. And we have so many questions for you and I have a lot of big feelings 
just <laughs> yeah after reading your book I have so many big feelings I'm so grateful that for all the women like you have blazed trails I'm grateful for this book I am inspired to continue to um, help women to become advocates in their life especially with their health but also so enraged so enraged and <laughs> after reading about essentially what has happened to us throughout all of history to bring us to this place that we're in where we're still not getting the treatment that we deserve. So in my world as an actor and a writer, we talk a lot about background and backstory. I would love to know what is your backstory? Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? And what brought you to the work of being a doctor and specific, specifically studying oncology? Well, I think what you're really bringing up is an important point about the context with which we experience the world. Yeah. And whether it's writing a book or discovering science, especially when it comes to science or math and it's more seemingly objective truths, it feels like in the moment that these are things that we're discovering that are absolute truth. But you and I both know, and as an actor, as a storyteller, that all the world is a stage in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And we integrate where we come from, society, culture, religion. It's absolutely woven into the fabric, the tapestry of who we are and how we experience the world. So what motivated me, I think, um, to go really far back into my mom is a therapist, my dad is a litigator. So there's a lot of questions in the family, a lot curiosity. of curiosity, who and where you come from and what your position is, what you advocate for, what you believe and where those beliefs come from. I grew up um, in Brookline, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston. It's a very intellectual, highly educated town. I went to public school, but went to school with kids who were sons and daughters of MIT and Harvard professors. It was extremely enriching. I live in New York City now, where I like to say that, unfortunately, the currency is often material and financial power. Where I grew up, it was very much your intellectual interests, your values, and, and this, not a puritanical view on life, but a very academically focused sense of life and that you kind of dig hard into questions. Mm. I was passionate about dancing and I still am. I thought, you know, my daughter asked me, what did you want to be when you were in third grade? And I definitely didn't say dancer. I, I mean, definitely didn't say doctor. I said dancer. And she's <laughs> like, well, could I be a dancing doctor? And yes, you can be. Yes, you can um, be. <laughs> so I have a lot of passion in things unrelated to science. But when I went to college, I knew that I wanted to major in the history of science because there was someone a little bit older than me that from the high school I kind of followed as she went to Harvard. And I didn't know what I wanted to pick. Like, I loved history. I loved writing. I loved literature. But I also loved science. I loved the language of medicine. I loved the language of chemistry and biology. And so for me, majoring in the history of science, and I just was at Harvard talking to some undergrads and giving a lecture there. It was such an incredible experience and in, in reinforcing the value of humanities when we think about science. Because if we look at medicine today and all the problems, a lot of it has to do is who's had a seat at the table, who's had the power, mm. and in that crafted the stories of what we should be curious about. Because so much of discovery, whether it's medicine or whatever we may be thinking about, it's having that curiosity. And the lack of curiosity at best is in part what has diminished women's health care over time, mm -hmm. that we've not really been listening to women. Not It's not just about do we have enough women at the table, but are we giving them the space to say what is actually wrong with them as mm -hmm. opposed to labeling things as syndromes that, you know, or benignly ignoring them yeah. over time. So for me, I uh, just to sum up a little bit, uh, when I was in college, I volunteered at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute helping women with wigs and breast prostheses. Mm -hmm. And I was... It was very early on, and, and I got this sense about how cancer was not just the organic chemistry that I was learning in the classroom, but equally related to how these women felt about losing their hair, what it was like for them to experience a traumatic diagnosis, look in the mirror, and maybe feel physically okay, but not look themselves. And so I had this experience of deep in the science in college, but also deep in the experience of illness for women. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of the beginning of the story of how I became so drawn to taking care of women with breast cancer and it became very much a calling for me. Mm. 
Well, you were creative from the jump. Um, the dancing and the way like that you just talked about it, you know, you can obviously hear that was a, a major love of yours. And that explains the creativity in your book and how <laughs> you were able to pull such like an incredible analogy for the way to talk about the entire female experience. And something you just said resonated so heavily with me was that women may have a seat at the table, but are we really giving them the voice that they need versus keeping them so small? And I mean, Nikki, I don't know that you and I, when we were talking about Mm -hmm. the questions that we wanted to ask, there was a quote in the very beginning of the book where you talk about, I think you were in the ER, maybe one of your first days as a resident, and you were crying because there was a patient that had come in who was potentially gonna pass away and your maybe it was like a chief resident or something said, you know, pull yourself together. Uh-huh. And your response was, I'm so sorry. I let the estrogen get the better of me. Yeah. And, you know, I just, I would love for you to speak a little bit about that. And just sort of as a doctor, we've, you know, obviously talked about how you became a doctor and why you chose this field. But let's move in a little bit to just talking about you as an oncologist and what that experience is like. Because... My mother had breast cancer and she had it very young and Mm. it's always been something that's over my head. You know, every year I get an Mm. MRI, every year I get a mammogram, you know, twice Mm. a year I'm screened and I still live with the fear of it every day. But what is it like on the other side of that when you're the person making that diagnosis and you're sharing space with women in that room? So I want to answer that. And if I digress and I don't answer it, please interrupt me and pull me back to that. Okay. Okay. But you said something about playing small, and there is a thread in my childhood that I probably didn't own up to that relates to this. So the person will go undated, but there was often someone in my family who would ask me, well, did I twirl there or did I behave? Did I behave? Mm -hmm. And very rarely, I think, do we say to like a man in some setting, oh, did you behave? Mm -hmm. And I can have a big personality. I'm I'm crap. I'm an introvert, but like, get me on a stage and I'm like all about the jazz, jazz hands. And <laughs> I'm the same, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm 50% introvert, 50% extrovert. Obviously I go on cameras and I act and I do, I can perform, but like I, you got out of pampers with jazz hands. Yeah. But I'm like, <laughs> like you, I am, people are shocked to know that I'm actually like an introvert. Yes. Yeah. However, a lot of my childhood was a lot like Play a little smaller. That's right. Mm-hmm. Play a little smaller. Like, are you going to wear your hair down and be like, hello, everybody? Or are you just going to be like right. the demure? Be seen and not heard. Yes. And, you know, it's it's a lot easier to be polished and put together. Only in my recent years have I thought, well, and it was this great expression. You may be too much for some people. Those aren't your people. Right. Or well-behaved women never make history, which right. has been like the line that I've said on repeat to this one family member, well-behaved women never make history. So please stop asking me whether I behaved because I don't want to behave anymore. Mm -mm. I don't want to behave anymore. I've I've done that. I want to twirl. great little girl. I love that. We can grow up and we can say what we want to say. We can have agency. We can have power. We can be respectful of other people, but we don't have to always play small to make the next person uncomfortable, uh, to make the next person comfortable. And I think a lot of what women do is the excessive apologizing, the worrying that you're burdening other people, that you're too emotional. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of that, all of these themes are a thread in medicine. Hysterical. We're all hysterical. Yes, we're all hysterical. (laughs) Now, that plays into the question that you're asking about becoming an oncologist. So first, I'm a deeply emotional person. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. Mm. And yes, when I first started out, the idea of crying with a patient was like, you could never do that. I cry with my patients now if I feel that it's appropriate and it it comes out. And these are people that I've known for a long time and I'm deeply invested. In terms of the anxiety that you talk about caring with the family history that you have and the anxiety that you have, I have the same fears in part because I have not developed boundaries with patients so well over the time over time. And I think when you're an empath and you're a deeply feeling person and you go into a field where everyone's like, oh, you gotta be all compartmentalized. Well, your patients don't want you to be so compartmentalized. No, they don't. But also there is some self-protection that has to go into place because if you 
are constantly setting yourself on fire to keep everybody else warm, you are setting yourself on fire. Oh, that's good. And I think there is a component of that that a lot of oncologists feel that you absorb their pain, that you care so deeply for them, that you wish you had more time, that you wish you could call them at one in the morning because you're up thinking about them, but it's just not appropriate. So I don't, I don't have the right answers. I think I've really struggled with anxiety that I feel for my patients wondering how I can access my own joy and fill my bucket because I'm not, you know, I take care of some people that are dying because I'm not dying with them. Yeah. Yeah. I am helping them. But a lot of times it feels like you've absorbed the anxiety, the death, the loss every day into your own body. I love how honest you are. Thank you for being honest. And also thank you for vulnerable. Yeah. Thank you for the way that you're humaning. Because at the end of the day, you know, I, a little backstory for me in 2017, uh, my, I was pregnant. My child in utero was diagnosed with multiple congenital heart defects and without immediate intervention, he wouldn't make it. And in that same week, my dad was diagnosed with a rare and aggressive form of dementia called Pick's disease. So uh, I knew I was going to lose my dad. The question was the- how quickly. Jeez. And then there was a huge chance that I was also going to lose my child because the type of heart surgery that needed to be done was very difficult. We got super fortunate with Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Um, But I was launched in this world of medicine. And now I'm the president of the board of trustees for Children's Hospital Los Angeles and deeply immersed in a lot of obviously both of us Alzheimer's and dementia work, but also that work as well. And I watch these doctors, and maybe it's different at a children's hospital, Is right? It? Because they are children. Is it? But I watch our, how different our doctors are than it's... adult doctors. It's... They are so with the kids, and they do break, and they do cry, and they do shatter when a child doesn't make it. Yeah. And there is something so... There is a tight rope, right? You're, you're providing the space for their families and for your patient but also at the same time you are a human being and I think the more that we can see that our doctors and our nurses and our like that they are human inside of all of this there is a safety to that and so thank you for bringing that to your patients I I under I can understand that that probably adds this extra layer of heaviness and weight to what you do but it matters so much it really does. I appreciate that. I don't. I don't know what the answers are. Yeah. I am. You know, I've been practicing a long time, and I've. I, I don't know what the answers are. It's hard. It's hard for, you know. I think a lot of times, patients, especially in the moment, particularly when they're handed really bad news, uh-huh. you know, they're looking at a doctor that they trust. We hope. Yeah. But oftentimes, you know, this is someone who's relatively new to their life, you know, but they're handed this life changing news that will forever change who they are. And that's a very sacred space that you're in every single day. And it's so much pressure on you. This podcast really, um, if we didn't tell you this already, it really got its roots in caregiving. Um, this podcast started as a way for me, who's my mother was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's and I was her primary caregiver, very young. And I had no resources. I had no one to turn to. I didn't know how to find support. And so I kind of just made it for myself. I went out there and I jumped on Instagram and I started finding people who were going through similar experiences. It's how I found, you know, my best friend for the rest of my life, um, (laughs) And I just started filming people talking and telling their stories and being vulnerable. And in it, you know, I built this community of people who were willing to share what caregiving really was. And this season, we're talking about it in a very, very different way. It's all things caregiving, right? So not just Alzheimer's and dementia and Parkinson's and ALS, but caregiving as a entire experience. You know, what is it like to care for somebody who does have cancer? What is it like to care for a child with cancer or um, a, a signif- doctor who is caregiving for patients, for patients every single day? You know, <laughs> well, there's also the space of the doctor who also has to do all those other things in their personal life. Yeah. 
So I'm very familiar with what you're talking about. And I, I applaud you for finding the resources. I don't think I've been able to. Um, really? And I think that Alzheimer's was one of the cruelest ones yes. because for all the reasons that we can imagine. But it really brings up the point, another point of um, what we're talking about with women and women's health care. But women are the primary caregivers, providers, yes. and decision makers of health care in our society. Yeah. And also women are two times more likely to have Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Two thirds of Alzheimer's patients are women. Yeah. And when we look throughout history of how we valued the aging woman, woman, let alone the aging woman with cognitive decline, it's not at all, right? You're Correct. damned if you're of reproductive age, but you're really damned if you get older because then you're, what are you good for? Right. And we've neglected the aging woman. I know everyone's talking about menopause right now, but there are so many other issues that women face related, but more tangentially to just getting older. Yes. And Alzheimer's is one area that we are desperate for, yes, more help and medicine and understanding from a scientific perspective, but also communities that, that really can help because it's such, it's, it is so challenging to be a caregiver in that setting. Yes. And I would love to pivot to your book for a second, because for people who haven't read it and I will be talking about this book I, for the rest of my life. I will tell, <laughs> well, just you. so you know, like I'm, I'm one of those people that like give books as gifts. I will be giving your book to every woman for years now. I appreciate Have you read this? Nope. Well, I'm going to send it to you in the mail. We could talk for days and hours. I could talk to you about the history of women's health uh, and your book and how phenomenal it was. Um, briefly, right? if you don't mind trying to sum a little bit of it up, but you did yep. say, you know, one of the things that you said that I think is one small piece of information that tells a big overarching long, bigger story is the fact that they didn't even started adding women and minorities to clinical trials, as you said, to what, like 1993? Yes. 90, yes. Good job. 1990. So, yeah. so it's just unacceptable. It's enraging. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So the book is a walk through women's bodies by organ system, by physiology, mirroring the specialties that we know today, like cardiology, neurology, musculoskeletal systems, gastroenterology. But it's also a walk through history with each of those chapters to go back and use stories, real stories of either patients from the present, doctors that I interviewed today, or going all the way back to whether it's an Egyptian mummy, a woman admitted to an asylum in the 17th century all these sorts of stories to show that you may relate. You may think you can't relate to that Egyptian mummy, mummy who died because she had urinary incontinence, but the fact that thousands of years later you think it's normal to pee on yourself when you go for a run because you've had a kid and you're enduring that, <laughs> Where, how far have we come? And that's why the chapter is called A Thousand Years of Holding It In. Yeah. Why do, <sighs> why do women not know that the field of urology also exists for women? It's not just about, you know, penises, right? Yeah. 50% of women, we are greater than 50% of the population, EP2. So digression, but the book is a walk through women's bodies using stories by organ system and history to really unpack the legacy, to have a better understanding of who we are when we walk into the patient's or doctor's office, either as a patient or as a physician. And it's really meant for a broad audience to, on both sides, think about the imperfect medical system that exists today. And not only how do we unpack where we came from, but how do we constructively move forward? Because it's not really about saying, oh, women are better doctors than men, or all these men were terrible in history, but really to enlighten where we come from so that we can more positively, thoughtfully move forward to today. That was beautiful. beautiful. Well done. One of my favorite chapters was your chapter on guts. Good. Because I feel there's so much tied up into that because it's not even just about you know, carrying babies and our periods and the stress that we carry there and how the patriarchy has used thinness to control women's bodies throughout history. And keep us small and again. And keep us going back to you talking about playing small. You know, I had disordered eating my entire life mm -hmm. and it was all about restraint and restraint from the time I was a little girl. So could you talk to us a little bit about... Catherine. Yeah. In, the in, was, the saint, right? So beautiful, so frail, whether it's the heroine she or the woman doesn't have a ravenous appetite because she's eating, or throughout Victorian era where we weren't supposed to eat meat because that was too romantic and lascivious and that might meet 
you know, cause sexual desire. I, I cover Kellogg, who, yes, the yes. Kellogg cereal. John Harvey Kellogg. Yes, but who also had these, you know, sanitariums and beliefs about enemas and restricted eating, and that especially for women, certain spicy foods or meat might incite this kind of, like, sexual desire in women. And would it really so also insane. Speak- Absolutely not. Uh, insane. But if you think about it, so much of ideas about women's sexuality yes. and desire is woven into every aspect of the ways that women's health care has been ignored or dismissed yes. or heightened, right? You're only supposed to have so much sex, but when your husband wants it and only when you're married, and whether it was masturbation would cause scoliosis or a lack of sexual desire or too much desire was causing your stomach issues. Again, it's this playing small, it's restricting, yes. it's not having your own power, whether it's to be strong, whether it's to have desire, whether it's to be intellectual. And this whole mind, body, gut connection really became also a way to control women in a lot of ways in terms of what we said they could or could not do. Yes. And even looking at the BMI today, body mass in- index, which we know is not a measure of health. No. But so much of it is raised on minority views and, and or I'm sorry, ignoring ignoring minority populations, different body types, and not actually thinking about what helps a woman be strong as opposed to small. Absolutely. And you do talk about that in muscles, which I love as well. Mm-hmm. Thank you for bringing up the restraint and restriction, because what I learned about my d- disordered eating was that... Um, that brain stays with you forever. It's so deep. It's Doesn't not it? just about the food that you're not putting in your body and you're not giving yourself. What you s- touch upon in this book, which I love, it goes so deep into like the way that we don't even allow ourselves to have pleasure. Mm-hmm. The way that we don't allow ourselves to experience the world and to have desire and joy and celebration and wildness Doesn't and all of these things because it is so generational what we've been taught yep. to mm-hmm. be ladylike, restrict, restrain in mm-hmm. all you do. And, and it's the beyond dainty food. eating. The, the, dainty the tea eating. sandwiches you talk tea about. Sandwiches. Tea yeah. sandwiches, the dainty eating, salads, like a man with like who's just like I don't know, worked in the field with like the turkey leg. There's all sorts of imagery that we can think about in history and art and literature that relates to how women's bodies have been seen historically. And even in fashion, what's considered attractive or not attractive. We were literally talking about this on the way here. Yeah. I told her I was at a store last week, like trying to get some tennis shoes. And I looked at one of the mannequins and it literally looked like the body of a 12 year old. And yet this is what's in stores everywhere. This is what women continuously are still being fed, not to use, you know, no yeah. pun intended, on a daily basis. And it just... Or it's like that woman with like that really snatched waist yep. and like that massive booty and like huge boobs. Like, how yeah. does that happen? Yeah. I feel like, you know, I feel very passionate about this, obviously, because we have been viewed through the patriarchal lens since Lynn, since the beginning of time, right? It's it's constantly feeding into what a man's idea of what a woman's body should look like, how a woman should behave, how we need to show up in the world, right? And it's it it is enraging to me. And we are dealing, we are at a time when there is a new wave of trying to control women's bodies. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm reading this book, I'm like, every woman, there has never been a time that people need to read this book more. The history. The history to understand that it doesn't just stop with our right to choose if we have a baby or not, or, you know, being in a situation, our our right to have choice over motherhood. It Mm -hmm. will not stop there. When you go back and look at it, they controlled every aspect of our health, what we put Literally. into our body, how we were diagnosed, how we were treated. If and you could s- ride a bike. If you could ride a bike because they were scared that a woman, it might be masturbat- masturbatory to get on a bike and ride it. And I was like, let me tell you, I did Soul Cycle for years. There was nothing that felt good on my vagina when it came to that bike. I was There was no masturbation there would that was also, happening. There would also like, be no one ever overweight with <laughs> two breasts and a vagina if that was true because everyone would be burning up the Soul Cycle across the world. Like how insane. Yes, and I, you touch upon something 
in the not just in the book but in your in interviews about gaslighting can you speak to the ways that women are being gaslit in medicine and also like you know growing up I was gaslit every day of my life right and it I didn't have a voice I grew up in the south again when little girls were to be seen and not heard and so were women so I didn't have this voice and the second I was able to have a voice believe me I used it and but I know when I'm being gaslit, but I don't think most women do. No. How do we, how, how are we being gaslit in medicine and how do we know when it's happening to us? That's a great question. And I've got to follow up for it. I think it's really tricky because it's easy for us to say it's like, again, like men versus women, but women, including myself, were educated in the same system as men, rubbers as cultures as men. I think some of it is not always this bad insidious intention but also the idea that to have compassion for one second towards the other side of health care which is that we do have this deep desire if you if you take at face value that people that enter medicine want to be there for good reasons want to help the next person and when there is a situation where you don't know the answer and you're pressed for time Mm. there is a subconscious psychological cycle that goes on well She just must be anxious. I don't know what's going on, but I don't have the time to figure it out. And I never learned what else this could be. So she's just batshit crazy, right? (laughs) Got this pain, it's wandering. Bitches be crazy, right? Yeah. Or like, you know, she's got these vague symptoms and maybe that she's constipated and she has diarrhea and like maybe she has some palpitations. I don't know what this could be. Like she's just stressed. Right. Right. A lot of times with things that we don't understand, it's easier to say it's other person who doesn't who who is the problem not ourselves right i think a lot of this is baked into the medical system because we have again not been curious enough about what we've have going been going through so they do see more hysterical they do seem to have more complaints because guess what they do we right. haven't addressed their problem right so it's this vicious cycle where yes there may be some a-hole doctors that are gaslighting people but i think for the most part it's that we just don't know. Don't have and the knowledge. And it's easier in some instances to blame the other person than to say, like, I'm going to take the extra time because yeah. I actually really have no freaking clue. And now I realize that all of medicine had no clue. But then how do I even begin to unpack this? Because, A, I'm a random community doctor in the middle of nowhere, or I work at a big institution, and I have all these other pressures on me. How am I going to tackle these big problems in medicine? Yeah. And to bring up your other point before, it was not until 1993 that women were even required to be included in NIH, National Institute of Health for Clinical Trials. It was not until 2016 that there were even mandates. You published a paper that you had to say if you were using an animal model, were the mice that you were studying new drugs on, were they female mice or male mice? And often they were predominantly male mice because they were less hormonal. And the thought is you didn't want women's hormones to be another variable that would obfuscate the mm-hmm. results of your trial. When in, when we need to figure out how women's hormones are giving variation to something, right? Ex- like instead of just ignoring that, it's like, well, actually we need to figure that out because now what we know about hormones and inflammation and all of that is like, it is the regulating of blood sugar and our hormones and how we can do that, that helps to bring down inflammation in our bodies and because, brains and in our brains, because a lot of that is what's making us sick. Yeah. Actually, and there's not, I mean, now, thank God, because of doctors like you, um, we're starting to learn more about this, but there was zero information on that for the longest time. I do agree that I don't think, my mother went through something where she she started becoming very sick and she lives in South Georgia. Hey. And she went to doctor after doctor after gastroenterologist. I And they were like, just take a Xanax. You need Good. to be on Zoloft. And I flew her to LA and had her meet with my doctors. I'm so lucky. We have great doctors in Los Angeles, also in New York. But part of their greatness is the fact that they are so curious. They don't give up. And if they don't have the answer, they go, I don't know. But you know what? Let's run some more tests. I'm going to send you to do this. And then we'll, and then let's reevaluate at that point in time. They're willing, male and female doctors, to say, I don't know right now. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and so when my mother did come to LA, she got the answer. She had SIBO. She had for months had SIBO, this overgrowth of bacteria in her gut that was 
causing her to not be able to eat. And when the doctors before were saying, Ugh, you're hysterical, take a Xanax, take a Zoloft and go about your day. So I do think it's probably less about gaslighting and more about just not feeling like they can say in that moment, well, I'm the doctor, I'm supposed to have all the answers instead of saying, I'm not really sure, but let's run some tests and let's see if we can get to the bottom of this. So that's yes. a great point. And how do you, like, for the person who's listening right now, like, let's pivot this conversation. To advocacy? A little <laughs> bit for, well, really the self-empowerment of women. Yes, exactly. Right? Because right now, I feel like that's what it's all about. I mean, there was a part in your book that, honestly, I didn't know this, and then Nikki drew a great parallel, but this symbol of the women's movement and of women's rights and freedom was the the flame of um, the flame of freedom or the torch of freedom Smoking. Talk, Smoking. talking about cigarettes. So the Surgeon General had already come out and said, cigarettes are bad for you. And yet there's Lucky Stripe or whomever making it, was it Lucky Stripe? That made the ad, the torch of freedom. And women start smoking thinking, oh, this is how I'm promoting my, my rights, my individuality, <laughs> myself as a woman. Hear me roar. Oh, and by the way, it's killing me. Like... How much more of an ironic situation could we have? So I feel like all of a sudden now women are taking control this of is- their health for the first time and getting curious and asking the questions. Okay. But I live in the South. I live in Nashville, right? I have suffered with endometriosis pretty much since I stopped having children. I think I was on the pill like all throughout my 20s and it masked it. And then the second I started having babies in between them, these crazy symptoms would start up, right? And then I'd get pregnant again. And so the symptoms would go away. And so everything kind of got band-aided until I was about 35. And then all of a sudden, which is like no man's land for women, right? Like that 35 to 45, because you're not in menopause and you're not really having children anymore. And you're in this gray zone. And same thing. It's not a Xanax, but it's, well, you could have a hysterectomy or just take the pill. Like, those are your options. That's it. So what do you tell the woman who's going to a doctor and is suffering from any reproductive symptoms, any physical symptoms, menopause, whatever it might be, precancerous, you know, like there's, there's a tenderness here or I feel a lump. And the doctor says, well, it's probably nothing. Let's wait and watch. Or don't trust your gut you're probably fine. What do you tell that woman? I think there's a whole spectrum of experience with illness and what people fear. Because there are definitely hypochondriacal tendencies where people cannot be, you know, they're just, they really are, they have tremendous healthcare anxiety that also needs to be wrestled with and comes from some place that needs to be addressed. And also, I would say, if you have a problem that is just not going away, and it's persistent, it's pervasive, maybe it's getting worse, and you've brought this up to your doctor and you do not feel heard or you feel like they don't like you or you can't trust them, you have to find a new doctor, which is a tall ask, depending tall on order these days, are. yeah. But you can't stick it out with someone who you feel is really not listening to you. Now, you can say, you can give them a try and be like, look, I know this appointment was really rushed, your schedule seemed really busy, but I, I am very concerned in the following ways. And come prepared. Also, don't come with like your bottle of medications, like your cosmetic bag, write them down. No one's gonna let, want to sit there and be like, oh, they take this bottle, that, write them down. Know what conditions you have, know what you've been diagnosed with, know what your family history is. Come prepared, bring somebody with you. If you feel like you're not being heard, bring a friend, bring a family member, and have another set of eyes and ears to objectively, more externally, look at the situation and say, here's what." But again, if you feel like you're not being heard, you got to find another doctor and trust your gut. Yeah. Why is that so hard for us to do? For, for women to do. I mean, I was talking to Liz about this being alone in the watchtower. I have a dear friend, too, that was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. She's, you know, been a survivor for many years. And we talk a lot about being alone in that watchtower, right? And yes, you have your team. Like with my son, we have an incredible team of people, his cardiologist, his hematologist, his, you know, I can go, we pulmonologist, we've been, we've been in all the different divisions. But I'm the keeper. I am the keeper of it all. And I'm the one that has saved his life on multiple occasions when even the best doctors of the best doctors have said, 
my love, you know, this was going into a second heart surgery that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, we just had an echocardiogram a month ago. His heart looked good. Nothing's wrong. And me knowing in my gut, something's not right. His breathing has shifted. He, I could see it in his chest. He's struggling a little bit more. Something's going on. I can't put my finger about it, or, or, but on it, but I can't let it go. Sure enough, I finally fought, even though I was told, well, you probably just have PTSD. Yes, that is true. I do have PTSD and also something's going on. I was willing to be called crazy in order to make sure that everything was okay. And my child ended up having a giant aneurysm in his pulmonary artery. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he had not, it had not ruptured was a miracle. And we had to go into like an emergency heart, open heart surgery with him. Heart. So if I had not continued and pressed and pressed and been willing to look like a crazy woman. Hysterical. Yeah, my child, we would like, he might not be here. So how do we get to that place where we are able to let go of how people perceive, perceive us. us in order to advocate for what we need? And why should it be that hard? <laughs> I am so sorry that you've been through all of this and, and I am so proud of you for advocating for your son and, and you. for trusting yourself. And I think it also speaks to the power often of mothers and women to again advocate for the next person but how do we channel that for, for ourselves? ourselves yeah often Thank you. like when you think about negative self-talk sometimes like would you talk to your friend that way would you talk to your loved one that way the flip side of that is if you're going to advocate for the people that you love so much in your life can you love yourself enough to advocate for yourself with this power with the same passion with the same love for what you deserve and value yourself the same way you value those around you. I don't have the answers for that. You read the conclusion of my book. I spent years literally taking everybody in my life to a doctor for different crises and un like with like foot drop that was undiagnosed and seeing the wrong people and being told I was fine. And ultimately I have like permanent leg damage from that. So I have learned my lesson. Um, and I, I, I hope I am never tested again because I, I don't know what I would do, but I really hope that I would advocate for myself the same way that I advocate for my patients and for my family. But it's incredibly hard, and I think it's more conversations like this and having a community where you talk to other people and you say, I'm worried about X, Y, and Z. And we share in that advocacy and say, if you are worried, go back. If you are nervous, go back. If it's about yourself, I'll come with you. I'll show up. That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I have done that with some friends where I've said, take me with you. I'll go with you. I'll be the keeper of your notes. And, you know, I did that with my mother because she just blacked out every doctor's appointment, you know? Yeah. Um, well, Dr. Komen, I know that your time, your time is limited, but it's also you have patience. You have so much to go attend to. Thank you so much for being with us today, for continuing the conversation. Thank you for writing this book. This beautiful book. I cannot even begin to tell you how grateful I am. Like I said, I'm gonna give it to every woman that I know. And um, I just think you are absolutely remarkable. And I we feel so honored to be, have been able to talk to you today. Thank you for it being here. It was a real, real pleasure, honestly. Well, Thank I you wanted you to so just much. say, I appreciate your valuing the work because yes, it's about a book, but it's really about a larger mission, a larger purpose that we can share in together and partner in together. So thank you for having me on the show, for amplifying the message and and really sharing in the work. I appreciate that so much. You are a true woman's woman. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it really I'm does. I'm pretty girly. You're pretty girly. <laughs> You're pretty girly. And you know what? I hope you continue to twirl every day. Twirl girl. <laughs> Thank you so much. I Thank appreciate you. that. Thank you so much for being on with us this morning. We really just, I've so enjoyed our time with you. Lots of love. Be well.